Q-Factor, something many of us will have heard of. But what on earth is it and how does it affect our bikes? Like many of the measurements and standards on our bikes, they can all seem a little bit confusing. Do I even have a Q-Factor? Should I upgrade mine? Do I need a bigger one or do I need a smaller one? First up, we need to know what Q-Factor is. Imagine we're sat on our bikes and we're looking down at our cranks. We've got our left-hand crank and we've got our right-hand crank sat in opposing directions. Through the middle, we've got our bottom bracket. And then what the Q factor is, is the width between those threaded faces where our pedals will attach. And it's the distance measured not diagonally across, but at a 90 degree angle, so parallel to our bottom brackets. I know I said it was a simple measurement, but I've got a fun little fact for you next. God. I do love fun facts. So Q factor was a term originally used by Guy Peterson, who worked for Bridgestone Bicycles at the time. And the Q, would you believe it, stood for quack in reference to the wide stance that ducks have. Amazing, who'd have thought of that? You certainly don't need science to explain that one. Anyway, the most common Q factor size for our road bikes is around 150 millimeters. And if you're using Shimano cranks, that'll be 146 millimeters. And Campagnolo cranks use a Q factor of 145.5 millimeters. But don't worry about that 0.5 millimeters. It's not gonna make much difference. And all bikes and cranks will vary because they've got different bottom bracket widths, different cranks, and slightly different frame designs. And if you ride a mountain bike, you have a Q factor of around 170 millimeters. And if you go even bigger than a mountain bike and ride a fat bike, they have Q factors all the way up to 200 millimeters and sometimes even more. And it's why you get that sort of feeling of when you're riding a fat bike that you feel like you're straddling a horse. The reason we have different Q factor sizes on our bikes is largely down to the size of the rear tire. If we have a particularly large rear tire, then we need to have a larger frame design to accommodate that. And as such, we'll have larger chainstays and a wider bottom bracket as well. So that will mean that we need to have larger crank and wider crank arms to accommodate those chainstays. Otherwise, as we pedal, those crank arms are gonna hit the chainstays and you won't be going anywhere fast. Equally, it can quite often lead to wider spacing at the rear hub. And as such, to keep everything in your drivetrain components in line, you need to have your chainring spaced slightly wider out still. So if the Q factor of our bikes is set by the frame and the standards of the parts and such like that, what do we need to know? Like, why do we need to know it? Well, this comes down to the fit of the bike. And as we all know, the fit of the bike is important to be comfortable, reduce the risk of injury, and also look to improve the performance on our bike. So if the Q factor is fixed, what can we adjust? Well, what we're actually referring to and what we need to look at is the width of your feet when you're riding your bike. So if, as a general rule, the Q factor on our bikes isn't easily or readily adjustable, how can we go about adjusting the position and the width of our feet on the bike? Well, first up, and one of the simplest things to do, is to use our cleats to adjust our foot position. Now, all cleats are available with adjustment, so fore and aft, so up and down, and then also left to right. So this can slide side to side, and as such, we'll move our foot a corresponding amount relative to our bikes, meaning we can adjust the width of our feet, be that in to make them slightly narrower or wider to accommodate for wider hip angle, for example. And also, we can adjust our left and right feet independently. So to adjust the width of your feet, you can also try to use a different pedal or axle spindle, such as this. So this Wahoo Speedplay pedal, for example, is available in a number of different axle widths. And that is referring to this end point here where the threaded part stops and where it would meet up against the crank arm on your bike and it's measured from there through to this center line of your pedal here. There are lots of different manufacturers out there, some with different lengths available and some just with that set standard one. Uh, this pedal axle, for example, actually measures in at 53 millimeters and that's one of the most common axle widths that you'll find. There are different ways, however, to change this because sometimes you can add a washer in between the crank arm and the pedal axle itself. You can add one to 1.5 millimeters there. And there are also pedal axle adapters and these thread into the crank of your bike and then you'll thread your pedal into that component. And as such, these actually increase your stance and the width of your feet by quite a dramatic amount. So about 20 millimeters each side. 
In the past, we've seen riders such as Jan Ulrich experiment with a super narrow Q factor on their bikes, particularly on their time trial bikes, in search of those aerodynamic performance advantages. However, what they did find is that in time trials of 30 kilometers so or more, that those aerodynamic performance advantages were outweighed by the loss of efficiency and ergonomics. Lance Armstrong famously tried to replicate this super narrow Q factor and he had the same problems too. Time trials over 30 km an hour, it was more beneficial to be more efficient on the bike and more ergonomically comfortable and you could develop more power in that position. Why do we need to set these things up correctly? Well, in terms of efficiency and performance, especially if you're racing, you want to be as efficient and as fast as possible. We don't want to waste any of our precious efforts. And if you're not racing, it's still just important to get right because chances are you're probably going to race your friends up your local climb or you want to race them to the cafe. Both are crucial times when you don't want to waste any of your efforts. But it's also crucial for reducing the risk of injury. Because if you think your hip, your knee and your ankle are not quite in line, then even over a relatively short ride of say two hours for example, at a cadence of 90 RPM, that's over 10,000 pedal strokes where you could ever so slightly be aggravating those joints and running the risk of causing an injury. There you have it, Q Factor is one of those often overlooked aspects of our bikes, but we now know what it is and how it affects us. And I'm actually quite intrigued to hear your thoughts on the Q Factor, so let those in the comments section down below. And if you did enjoy this video, give it a big thumbs up and consider subscribing to GCN Tech to see more cool tech content. See you later.